Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. We see in David this remarkable character who's very inspiring, but altogether relatable, entirely relatable to us as well. This story is in here because God wants us to understand the significance of the gospel. And this story is in here because God wants us to take that gospel to a hurting world, not only with our mouths, but with our hands as we serve other people. See, the interesting thing about uh, temptation in the Bible, we're never called to fight temptation. 1 Corinthians uh, 6.18 tells us, flee. That's the word you're looking for, not fight. This is what true friends do. When they realize that you're in a moment of need, they move towards you. It's in this moment that Jonathan steps in and he helps David get his eyes off of the problem and onto the promises of God. This story is a staggering illustration of what happens when sin goes unaddressed. True repentance is meant to lift you up. It's not meant to get you down. It is life-giving. Repentance offers healing. It offers freedom. We repent because we are forgiven. And that is the scandalous good news of the gospel, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. A thousand years after King David, one even greater than David came, and that is Jesus, the King of all kings. And he said to us, don't worry. Oh, no, let's be clear, you can't win, but I will fight for you. The reality is our sinful in lives they're never going to be perfect, no matter how much we try to position them as looking perfect from the outside but a heart full of Jesus. That is better than perfect. Well, good morning, Faith Bridge. Welcome here in the Klein campus. Welcome to the Woodlands campus. Welcome to those of you joining us online. I am glad that you are here today. So this is it, the big finale. We're wrapping up our series on the life of David, better than perfect. And so you've made it. This is the moment. Are you guys ready? Yeah? All right, well, let's jump right in. The ushers are gonna come forward. They'll be giving out the Bibles. We're gonna be in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles chapter 28. If you need a Bible, go ahead, raise your hand. Uh, Let them know that you need one today. And if you don't have one, keep this one as our gift to you. So we are looking today at the end of David's life, his legacy. Now, legacy, that's a big thing to think about, right? Like, do you remember your great, great grandfather? Do you remember their name? Do you remember much about them? Probably not, maybe even your great grandfather. Legacy is an interesting thing to think about. Like what we'll be remembered by when we're gone? And this became really clear to me a few weeks ago when I spent time with my grandfather before he passed away. You see, back in June, my grandfather was diagnosed with this rare form of cancer. And by the diagnosis was in June and by the end of August, he was gone so fast. And it was about time for back to school when uh, my dad called and said, I just don't think he's gonna make it much longer. You, You should come. And so my boys and I went to Alabama to visit him for the last time, knowing that it was time to say goodbye. And the time when we were there, it was incredibly hard and emotional, but it was so sweet to have this time with him before he was gone. You know, we had these beautiful lucid moments where he would wake up and he would know us and he would know my boys and he would tease them and he would kiss them. And I got to tell him how much I loved him. And we got to laugh together about times, fun times that we had had. But most importantly, before I left, 
he got to give me these final words of wisdom and speak into my life words that I'll cherish forever. And in our passage today, we find David in a similar situation. He's almost 70, and he's near the end of a 40-year reign, and the time has come for him to crown a new king, his son Solomon. And in verse 1, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 1, it tells us that David calls together all the important people of Israel. He calls the officials of the tribes, the officers, the commanders, the stewards, the palace officials, the mighty men and seasoned warriors. This was anybody who was anybody in those days to participate and be part of this monumental moment in Israel's history. And here's David this aging, beloved king, looking out on the faces of the people that he loves so much, God's people. And then you have Solomon, who was probably a young man in his early 20s. Don't you know he was full of nervousness and anticipation, preparing to become a king? And it tells us in verse two that David rose to his feet when the ceremony started and he began speaking to the people of Israel. And first he made a charge to them. And then he turned and he spoke to Solomon. In front of all the people that Solomon would lead, he spoke words of wisdom to him, words of advice from a king, but also from a father. Don't you know what an emotional moment this must have been for them both? Let's take a look at verse nine and we'll see what David says. He says, and you Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. If you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Be careful now. For the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Don't you imagine that in the days leading up to this moment that David did some reflection of his life, some soul searching, looking for the right words of wisdom to pass on to his son, the new king? These are weighted words. They're careful and they're chosen. And the first thing that David says to Solomon, he says, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father. So David, after looking back over 70 years of his life, scrolling through the memory book of his conquest, of his victories, of his strategies, of his failures, of his kingdom, of everything that he had accomplished. And he says, Solomon, above all things that I wanna pass to you, I want you to know God. He places knowing God as the utmost priority for a new king, not military strategy, not politics, not managing a household, not taking care of all the things that go on in a kingdom, not managing this astonishing wealth that Solomon would inherit, but to know God. And I think maybe that seems a little simple or obvious for us today, right? We would nod our heads and say, yeah, that's a good word. That's a good word from a father, know God. Check, got it, know God. But I wonder, do we really, do we really know God? Because I fear, and I think that far too often, we confuse knowing about God with knowing God. That we know about God, about kind of like the way we know about the Queen of England or Tom Brady. Like we know a lot about them, but they're not close personal friends like that we would call up or text or have a chat with. I mean, you might, but I'm not the friends with them. But we do know a lot about them. But they're these distant kind of figures off that we know about, but they're not real to us in our everyday lives. And I think sometimes that describes our relationship with God. We know a lot about him, but he's not real to us. And to truly know God, he has to be real. I grew up in a small town in Alabama in a family that went to church every time the doors were open. 
I went every Sunday, every Wednesday night. I knew all the Bible verses. I was immersed in church. And if you had asked me then, do you know God? I would have said, yeah, mm -hmm. I know a lot about God. But he was never real to me. I was never connected to him in any kind of relationship. In fact, I sort of pictured him as this distant, far off um, figure, maybe like a dictator or sort of like a tyrant, kind of a puppeteer pulling the strings of our life who it was easy to make angry or be disappointed because there was a lot of rules and I was really good at breaking them all the time. And it wasn't until I was 26 that I went on a spiritual retreat one weekend. Now this was totally new to me. I'd only been a believer at the time for maybe a couple of years. And when I went on this retreat, I had no idea what the weekend would bring. Uh, but most of the weekend was spent in silence, which was a total foreign concept to me at that time and still can be sometimes. But the silence gave you time to where you had to talk to God. There was no one else to talk to. And so over the weekend, there was one evening that we found ourselves in this little chapel and it was lit only by candlelight. Uh, and we settled in on the benches. We were gonna have a time of communion. But first they gave us time to pray and to talk to God. And I sat there on the bench and I closed my eyes. And in those moments, I felt God speak to me for the first time. The best I can describe it, it was like this whisper that I felt in my soul. Like he was bringing things to my mind. And at one, I opened my eyes when I first heard it and I looked around and thought, did anyone else hear that? And then I closed my eyes again and he began to speak to me about my brokenness, uh, about things that I was holding on to, uh, unforgiveness, things that, were carry, that I was carrying around that were keeping me from him. And I remember at one point he told me to open my eyes. When I did, there was this image on the wall of Jesus. And he was on the cross and he was broken, beaten, bloody. And I felt God say to me, he's real and I'm real. And Luann, I am not the God that you think that I am. I'm not angry at you. I'm not disappointed in you. In fact, that could be farther from the truth. I love you. You see Jesus there? That's, that's how much I love you. My love is real. And it was in those moments that I began to experience what it meant to have a relationship with God. I turned my heart over to him in a way and he began to be a part of my life that was real. And in fact, in those moments, it went, God went from being the God that I read about to my God. From being someone that I just knew a lot about to someone that I was deeply acquainted with. And it was never really the same again. God plays an active role in my life, speaking to me and guiding me. Not only had I had this encounter or experience with God, but I was getting to know him really for the first time. And so I wanna ask you today, I wanna ask you the question, when was the time that God became real to you? When was the time that he went from being the God to your God? And if you can't answer that today, it's okay. God wants you to be honest with him Tell him, say, I'm not sure, God, that I know you. I've had that moment where you've become real to me. Or maybe you think, you know, I did know God like that at one time. There was this season where I was walking so closely with God. Maybe it was a mission trip. Maybe it was a time of suffering. Maybe it was like me when you first came to know Jesus. But lately it feels like he's distant again. It doesn't feel the same. You don't feel as close anymore. Well, let me encourage you with the second thing that David says to Solomon. First, he says, Solomon, know God. And then he says, in the second part of verse nine, Solomon, if you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. 
Solomon, if you seek him, he will be found by you. What a beautiful promise of God that if you seek him, he will be found. And I wonder if David in those moments looked at young Solomon and thought about everything that Solomon was gonna face as king. All of the temptations, all of the distractions, all of the things that would compete for his attention. And I wonder if David thought, Solomon's son, if there is anything that I could have done different, if there's anything that you can do different, it would be to never stop seeking God. Because David learned something that I bet most of us have experienced, that there are seasons where we are neglectful of God. And it was in those seasons that David made some of the most tragic mistakes of his life. There are seasons where we just don't give God much thought. We don't pursue him. We don't read about him. We don't pray. We don't study him. He's not something that we think about a lot. We just become numb to his presence. So I want to try something today, okay? All right, so I bet most people have a penny, right? Either in your pocket or in your purse or maybe in all the cracks in your, in your car. <laughs> there's probably some pennies, but don't take one out because we're going to do a quiz and there's no cheating because this is church, okay? All right, so I'm going to ask you some questions and see if you can answer them. So without looking, can you name the word imprinted on our one cent piece? Do you know which way Lincoln is facing? Do you know what image is on the tail side? To the right of the image, there are initials. What are they? Whose are they? Don't know? Neither do I. And I wrote these questions. But we all know what a penny looks like in general. You see them every day, but you can't answer the questions. Why? Because we don't look at things and study things that we think we already know. We don't take time to look at things and study things that are familiar with us. In fact, I bet for most of us, we don't even see pennies on the sidewalk when we walk by anymore. They're just not that valuable to us. And I'm afraid that there are seasons when God becomes just another penny on the sidewalk that we step over because we're too busy, we got things to do, we got goals to meet, we got kids' activities, we got a lot of stuff happening, and we don't have time to stop and pick up that familiar thing and study it again. But all good relationships flourish when there's pursuit. When we seek God, we get to know Him. And when we don't, we drift away. It's like that in all relationships. So when my husband Justin and I were first married, uh, I remember this time. So when we were dating, it was like serious pursuit, like flowers and crazy things and going to things that you don't even care about because the other person does and talking for hours to get to know each other and finding out all the things about your life and just hot pursuit, right? And then we got married. <laughs> and it wasn't so much the same anymore. <laughs> And when we first got married, I was working a weekend night shift and my husband was working like regular traditional hours during the week and we literally hardly ever saw each other. We were passing in the night, we had different sets of friends and I just felt like things were off and we were drifting apart. And one night I asked him to stop and pick up dinner for us on his way home from work. And so he did. And I will never forget when he handed me my plate and I took the top off and I immediately started sobbing. <laughs> he was like, what? I was like, you bought me mashed potatoes and gravy. He was like, yeah. I hate mashed potatoes and gravy. You've never seen me eat mashed potatoes and gravy. I've never eaten mashed, I don't even order them. I was like, you don't even know me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're still married. Hey, there's that. <laughs> the mashed potatoes, though, are just an indicator of a deeper problem that we had stopped pursuing each other. We had stopped getting to know each other. And it's something that we learned early in our marriage. It doesn't come easily to us, and it doesn't come naturally either. 
we oftentimes get off course and we have to reconnect and put date nights on the calendar and schedule time to be together and try to find time to talk without children present because if you have children, you know it's impossible to have real conversation if they're around. <laughs> it takes intentionality and it's the same with our relationship with God. It's a lifetime of continually pursuing Him, making time for Him, getting to know Him, growing with Him. A.W. Tozer says this about the relationship between seeking and knowing. He says, what I am anxious to see in Christian believers is a beautiful paradox. I wanna see them in the joy of finding God while at the same time they are blessedly pursuing Him. I wanna see them in the great joy of having God, yet always wanting Him. And that's what David knew when he said, Solomon, know God and seek Him. And then the third thing that David tells Solomon is in verse 10. He says, be careful now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. David says to Solomon, know God, and seek him because it is then you can live out the purpose that God has for you. David says to Solomon, God has chosen you. David is calling Solomon to fulfill his purposes. God chose Solomon to build the temple. And for you, for me, for each and every person in here different, in here, your purpose is different but you have one. God has given each and every one of us a purpose and it's probably not building a temple, but he created you for a reason. It's not by accident or coincidence. He has purposed you and he has chosen and prescribed every detail of you from your shape, your size, your hair color, your skin color, your gender, where you live, everything about you has been purposed. And David knew this because he wrote this beautiful Psalm 139 that says, you know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit how I was sculpted from nothing into something like an open book. You watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I even lived one day. We find our purposes not in our jobs, not in our careers, not in our kids, not in our families, not in anything that exists in this world, but in God. And when we know him, when we chase after him, it is then that we can live out those God-given purposes. When I was in Alabama saying goodbye to my grandfather, he asked me if when the time came that I would speak at his memorial. And after he passed away, I sat down to write <laughs> about his life to summarize his life, to honor his legacy, to think about the things that were important to him. And I started thinking about myself. I thought, what would my legacy be? What would people say was important to me when I was gone? What words of wisdom or advice will I have passed on to my children? Because it's inevitable we will all face the end of our days. And the events of this week has made it painfully aware that we never know when that's gonna be. And when it happens, a friend, a child, a loved one, a pastor, your grandchild, will sit down and try to honor your legacy, to write about what's important to you, how you lived your life. And I wonder if we, like David, can we survey everything around us? Can we survey our careers and our families and our kids and everything that we spend time doing, our kingdoms that we've built for ourselves? Can we look at that and say that to know God was the number one thing in our life? Would there be evidence that we pursued Him in this life? If we look at how we schedule our time or schedule our family's time, how we use our resources, the things that are important to us, would we be able to say that knowing God and seeking Him 
was our legacy? What would your legacy be today? It's a big question. And I think about this a lot as a parent. You know, I know that my relationship with God and that my kids' relationship with God is the most important thing. I know that it is. But I think a lot of us, me included, we fall into this trap where we want our kids and even ourselves to be successful. We want them to be happy. <laughs> and so we talk to them a lot about making good grades and having hard, doing hard work and making sure in the right activities and that you're on the right team and that you have the best coach and that you're being tutored and that you're doing everything you can to be successful in this life. <laughs> And when we do, bit by bit, we sacrifice the most important thing, their relationship with God by being too busy because we become too busy to sit and take time to talk about God or to pray or to be in community or even to have time to love and invest in the people in our lives. No time or margin for that or to serve other people. And so what happens is it bit by bit, it chips away at our ultimate purpose until all those other things have become our purpose and we have lost sight of the most important thing in life. God, knowing him, pursuing him, and living out his purposes. David's life was far from perfect, as we have seen over the last few weeks. But in this, David found success. He served God's purpose. God promised David, when your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. God was promising David that his descendants would become a dynasty of kings, that his descendants would take his place on his throne over Israel. But this wouldn't be like any dynasty that the world had ever seen. No, God had something so much bigger planned because when Jesus was born in a stable in Bethlehem, God fulfilled that promise that he made to David. From the lineage of David came a true king, Jesus. A king who established his kingdom not through war and not through politics, but through love and mercy and sacrifice. A king who lived a sinless life, one full of truth, the life that no earthly king or earthly person could ever lived. A king who was crucified and buried, but resurrected to sit on the throne of heaven forever. We have a king who made the way for us to know God and to pursue him and to live out our purposes. We have a king who is far better than perfect. And the best part is we have a king who's always with us, empowering us to do these things through his Holy Spirit. Acts 13, 36 tells us that David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers. God, that it would be said of me that Luann, after she had served the purpose of her own generation, fell asleep and was laid among her fathers. I want it to be said of all of us. So we're gonna do something today. I want you to stand up, all right? In all our rooms, stand up, yep. And we are gonna do this together. I want you to put your name in that blank. And I want you to declare it today that that is your purpose. And we're gonna do it together, okay? When I say ready, I want you to say your name and I want you to declare it loud, okay? Ready, go. Luann, I choose she had to serve. God. 
Lord, let it be so. Let it be so that you, let it be so that all of us here as a family at Faithbridge would pursue God and that we would live out His purposes for this generation. That is a legacy worth leaving. Let me pray. God, I thank you for every person in this room today, every person that is listening. God, you purposed them and you created them and they are precious to you. God, I wanna pray right now for the people, for the people who when asked, when did God become real to you? They thought, I don't know. I don't know if he is. Right now, God, I wanna ask that you would reveal yourself to them, God, that you would become real, that this would be an experience or an encounter with you that would change their lives. And if that's you in the quietness of your heart right now, I want you to tell God, I want to know you, God. I want you to be real to me, God. I wanna surrender my life right now. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what it will be like, God, but I am gonna trust you right now and I'm gonna leave here different today. And for everyone who thought, God, I knew you one time, I did. I was so close to you and there was this season and I remember it and I want it back. God, declare it to him right now. Say, God, I have gone astray. I have drifted. I have been distracted. Confess that I have not pursued you, but starting right here, right now today, it's gonna be different that I'm gonna walk out here, God, you and I, are going to have a relationship where I pursue you and I study you and I engage you and God, I just wanna know you. And for all of us here today, God, wouldn't it be amazing for Faithbridge to be known as a generation of people who lived out your purposes right here, right here in this place in Spring, Texas, God, that the world, would be different because of us, because we have a king who empowers us here, God. So I wanna pray, God, that we would be a people who know you, who make you known, who seek you, who chase you, who run after you with everything that we have. Thank you for the promise that you made to David. Thank you that you fulfilled that promise by sending a true King. Thank you for the life, the new life that he's given us all. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I am joined today by Lou Ann Riley, who just wrapped up our Better Than Perfect series with a sermon called Legacy of Purpose. Lou Ann, thanks so much for being here with us. So we got a couple questions that came in. Uh, The first is someone wanted to uh, know if you elaborate on the difference between knowing about God versus actually knowing God. If you could talk about like what that looks like practically. Practically, yeah. yeah. Um, You know, as I described in my experience, um, that you can grow up in church and you can be totally immersed in Christian culture to come here every Sunday and you're learning about God, but you can miss knowing Him. Uh, And I think practically, if I was going to explain kind of how that looked like, looked, I think uh, the first way to know God is through Jesus, Mm -hmm. uh, is to surrender your life and your heart to Him. Mm -hmm. Until you do that, it's always going to be something that you know about or that you think think about, but your life is not, your heart is not engaged in the relationship. And so uh, I would say that the first step to knowing God is to know know His Son Jesus and surrender to Him. And then... um, I think there's practical things. You know, we talk about reading the Bible. Uh, Even then, you can uh, read the Bible uh, for a lot of knowledge. There's uh, 
theologians <laughs> everywhere who know a lot about the Bible, but right. yet don't know God personally exactly. or haven't experienced Him. Um, and I think without the relationship with God, without mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit, that we could approach the Bible like a textbook, exactly. like it could just yeah. be words on the page. Yeah. Uh, but we really have to think about our approach to studying God's Word. He's there yeah. on the pages. Yeah. All You think about just this wisdom He gave to Solomon, and the whole book is words to us about God's heart mm -hmm. and who He is and how much He loves us. Uh, and it's just woven through the whole thing. And so when we approach the Bible uh, with our heart and we approach it through uh, the Holy Spirit, we can God reveals yeah. Himself to us in that way. Um, and it goes uh, hand in hand with prayer. That's right. um, you know, as we pray, uh, and you engage the Bible. I know one of the methods that we use a lot is soap because mm -hmm. it ha it uses scripture uh, and prayer right. together because uh, the Holy Spirit does play a role in engaging God and praying to Him and asking God to show me right. yourself or show me what you have for me exactly. in this text or in these words. Um, and I think prayer is so central to knowing mm -hmm. God. Um, and I know I can even get in patterns where my prayer is me to God a lot, but that right. silence that I talked about, the giving God space to speak to mm -hmm. you and into your life, uh, it, you have to be intentional about yep. it. It doesn't just happen. Right. Um, setting aside time to be quiet, to withdraw from mm -hmm. everything else that's happening and the distractions that are going around and really spend time connecting with God um, and uh, seeking to know Him in that way. Um, any of the time, I think, that you intentionally, just like it said, if you seek Him, He will be found. Yeah. He's there. That's right. He never leaves. It's us. Right. <laughs> we get distracted. We get distant. We get in all these places. Uh, and so creating space to pursue Him the way that you would a relationship mm -hmm. in your life, that you yeah. want to know that other person. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and so, uh, and you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a reason why Scripture, why we say it's still alive today, mm -hmm. and it's because by the power of the Holy Spirit, those words, um, they impact us the same way they impacted people 2,000 years ago. Yep. Um, but uh, without that Holy Spirit, then you're right, they're just words on a page, and they have no actual impact on us, no meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, and so reading Scripture, but then praying that the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit moves uh, through you in, in that scripture, that's, mm -hmm. that's key. Right? Yeah. Uh, and then the second question that we had was uh, about purpose. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a lot about purpose. You talked about um, leaving a legacy. And um, I know that there's a lot of people who struggle to find, to figure out what their purpose is. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there's people who uh, maybe they have two different routes that they could go. Maybe it's like with a job or something. And they're just wondering, you know, which way do I go? Uh, which way does uh, God want me to choose? And so uh, could you speak a little bit to um, discovering our purpose? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think we all want meaning yeah. for our lives and fulfillment. And our tendency is to try to find it in things that we can see, yeah. things that are tangible, our careers and our jobs and our kids and um, all those things uh, is where we find our, is where we try to figure out our purpose. Um, and what David's saying to Solomon and what we see over and over scripture is God says, seek me, know me. Right. That's your purpose. Exactly. And I believe that at the core of that is when you are seeking after God, when mm -hmm. you are working on your relationship with Him, when you are actively pursuing God, you will find your purpose. Right. And I think it could be either choice. Exactly. I don't think that you, uh, if you choose to be an accountant or you choose to be a lawyer, that you can't serve God's purposes in both right. of those places because we know that we're called to make Him known. That's right. We know that we're called to love people and you can do those in any of those places. But I think what happens is we think too much about that being the purpose of our mm -hmm. life. Uh, and uh, David is saying, no, 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 go back to the basics of seek me, know me, right. and I will guide you. He will speak exactly. to you and guide you uh, as we go in our life. I do think, you know, our purposes change. Yeah. Like there's a season where we're living out this purpose and then God calls us to a different place or space, but all of our purpose is pointed at Him right. and knowing Him. Um, you know, I remember when I uh, first became a believer, one of the books that was dusty, I had this whole box of books that uh, good-minded 
loving Christian people had given me yeah. that it would like be the book that like brought me back to Jesus. Right. Uh, and I had this whole box of them. And one of the first ones that I took out after I came to know Jesus, I actually wanted to read the books, mm -hmm. uh, was Purpose Driven Life oh, yeah. uh, by Rick Warren. And uh, it has shaped a lot of uh, just what I think about purpose because he comes back to this. Your God-given purpose is to know God. That's right. And when you do that, everything else will fall in place. That's, yeah, that's mm -hmm. exactly right. Whether you want to be a lawyer or a doctor, mm -hmm. whatever it is, you can still know and love and pursue God mm -hmm. and then accomplish His purposes any, wherever anywhere you, you are. are. Right, because yeah. God's working wherever everywhere. Wherever He puts you, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, Luann, thank you so yeah. much for your sermon today. It was a great word. Uh, and thanks so much for being here with us. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.